Hey, this is Joel Duff. Welcome back to my channel. Um, yeah, I'm just jumping on here real quick to respond to something that Ken Ham said within the last 24 hours. He's been he's taken to like writing these long form tweets or X's or whatever the heck they're called now, uh, which he then puts on Facebook. And then eventually they transition to being part of his blog on his Answers in Genesis uh, website. And they're just his uh, his reactions to things out there and things that are apparently on his mind that he feels like he needs to say. And he's got a lot of time on his hands now because he's not involved in like the day to day operation of answers in Genesis. So he just tweeted about um, or Facebooked about missing links. Sometimes there's nothing like looking at someone who doesn't understand the biology all right, in order to learn something about biology. So we're going to use Ken Ham as a teaching moment. But more than that, I'm going to flip Ken Ham's missing links, intermediate fossil question that he has or challenge that he has. I'm going to flip it around. I'm going to point it right back at it, Ken Ham, because he has a missing links transitional fossil problem that is a big problem for young earth creationism and answers in Genesis in particular. Want to know what that is? Well, stick around. We'll cover that coming up next. Okay, here we are. This is uh, his Facebook version uh, when he's talking about missing links. So here we have Ken Ham saying, I've often wondered about the term missing link. What do evolutionary scientists find? Nothing. What do they label that as? A missing link. See, when they find nothing, they call it a missing link. How do we know it's missing? Well, that's because we didn't find it, therefore it's missing. If we don't find it, then how do we know it's missing? Because the evolutionary belief demands that it be there. We expect that there is connections between different species and different kinds of organisms. And therefore, if we don't find them, we call them missing links. This apparently is a huge problem in his mind. Like he says, okay, now I know I'm getting confusing. We've all heard about missing links and missing links in the evolutionary story about animals and men. Now with humans, now he goes on a long rant about how uh, all humans, which he calls humans, and it was all fossil hominids that he considers humans like neanderthals and uh but not homo naledi but some other homo species uh that have been identified he's going to try to claim that uh there can't that there are there's a big giant missing gap so he's going to call that a missing link and he's to say it's missing and therefore there's no connection between the two All right, i don't want to deal with that the, the human part of this so ken ham is I guess making fun of evolutionary biology saying like there's all these missing components and they believe by faith that they exist they just have faith that there is an intermediate fossil somewhere uh, that we simply haven't found it yet um, but there's so many missing links in his mind that all these different organisms aren't connected and therefore they don't have common ancestry right? this is his, one of his arguments against common ancestry all right well let's let's think about missing links for a moment and why information about the world is might be missing and I'll, let's stick to an example of canines because ken ham likes to talk about dogs and answers in genesis likes to refer to canines as an example of a created kind a kind of thing that that god made in the six days he made a kind a, a carnivore kind right i'm sorry not a carnivore kind a canine kind and that canine kind existed from the original creation up through Noah's flood and then two canines were preserved whether there were many species of canines before uh, Noah's ark and many of them went extinct that's a little bit blurry right, for young earth creationists but they do know and they would say that two individual canines were preserved on the ark now after those two canines got off the ark what happened to them according to the consensus i'll call it the consensus view of young earth creationists today those two canines gave rise to additional individuals all right they reproduced after their own kind and as they continued to reproduce after their own kind um eventually what we see today is we see what 35 different species of what we recognize today as canines including a number of different species of foxes uh, then you got your golden jackals, you got your gray wolves, your coyotes, Ethiopian wolves, African wild dogs, and so forth. 
right? And all of these in the young earth creationist uh, model of the origins of the diversity of life on earth all came from just two individual canines. Okay, now I'm going to ask the question of Ken Ham and young earth creationist, where's, aren't there missing links here? And if there are missing links, can, can, can answers in Genesis provide all the connections between all these living dogs that we see today and those two individuals that are on, the, on Noah's Ark? Do they have all the intermediate fossils? Do they have all the transition fossils between them? Right? Or do they have a whole bunch of missing links? Are they relying, are they filling in the gaps? There's nothing there. In many cases, now I, I've, I've done a little bit of background research. Yes, there are a lot of canine fossils. Almost all those canine fossils are either associated with the species you see here, the living species today, some of which have been around for hundreds of thousands of years, if not over a million years. And there are many other different kind of canine species that have been found in the fossil record that have been named as separate species, right? There's species that are similar to some other fox, but there's a whole bunch of different fossils we found that represent a population that has different characteristics than any alive today. And we, we claim that there are different species than what's alive today. So now, does Ken Ham, what, what's he gonna do with those? Is he gonna call them transitional fossils? Are they transitions between the species from the past to the species that are here in the present? Have we found the intermediate fossils? Maybe they were just separate species that went extinct and didn't leave any ancestors at all. So none of the different dogs that are, none of the different carnivores or, I'm sorry, canines that are alive today uh, have any uh, uh, direct link, all right? They're not direct ancestors of any of those different fossils. How does he know? Can he prove that any of those fossils are the missing links between the two? After all, was Ken Ham there? Was he there to see two canines on the ark? Actually, does he know that there were two canines on the ark? Was there a report of two canines on the ark? No, there's, that's an inference. He's doing historical science. The thing that he says you shouldn't trust, right? <laughs> he wasn't there. He didn't see it. There's no observational report. He is inferring from the present species and, inf and, and making a judgment about what a kind represents and therefore inferring that there must have only been two canines of this kind on the ark. But let's go back. Was Ken Ham there when those two canines got off the ark? Somebody was there. They could have reported it, but they didn't. We don't have any eyewitness report of two canines and then what happened to them. Oh, they had a litter of 10 pups. And those 10 pups had some variation in Two of those pups wandered off, and a male and a female, and they had more offspring. And one of those offspring, you know, was was looked like, you know, they originally looked like foxes, but one of their offsprings popped out and had all the characteristics of an African wild dog, right? Different behavior, different snout features, different sized teeth, different intestinal tract, right? Different kinds of claws, right? Do we have a report of that? No. What, what does Ken Ham think happened, right? There was every one of these individual, so this is a, a phylogenetic tree based on uh, DNA sequences. And so uh, let's do an easy one down here, right? Gray wolves and coyotes, right? Pretty much everybody accepts that gray, oats and coy gray wolves and coyotes are the most similar to each other, right? They're very similar to one another compared to everything else. This is what creates a nested hierarchy, right? Dogs are more similar to gray wolves, and therefore they cluster, all right, genetically, morphologically, and all kinds of other characteristics associate those two together. And then if you ask what group is most similar to those, well then, well then you'd have to, you would probably group in the coyotes. And then if you ask what group is most similar to those, but much, a little more different, you'd end up with the golden jackals. And so you get this nested hierarchy. And the nested hierarchy represents well, we could infer represents their relationships in the past, their common ancestors. There was a common ancestor. There was a population that existed sometime in the past here. Some individuals in one environment eventually adapted, gained new traits, right? Experienced different conditions and ended up with the characteristics that we today identify as a golden jackal. Other members 
ended up becoming a different population. And that population eventually itself divided and became separate groups that were genetically distinct and distinguishable to us. And we call, we give them different names. Right? All along the way, there are individuals that are represented by these historical ancestors, right? And those ancestors had different characteristics. They weren't exactly like golden jackals. They weren't exactly like coyotes. They weren't exactly like gray wolves, right? They had some intermediate features. So if we had a fossil that had the intermediate features of all those different things, we might call that a transition fossil. Now, actually, it would be a species. It was a perfectly viable species. It wasn't like, I'm a transition. All I am is a transition, right? Uh, I'm not actually a species. I'm a transition from one species to another. Well, really all species, all individuals and in all species could be called that. They are transitions potentially to another species. So any fossil you find is potentially a transitional fossil. And any fossil you find potentially is a missing link between two different lineages or, or a past lineage and a present lineage. But not necessarily. They could be a lineage that is a separate population that went extinct and isn't represented today. And therefore is not a link, all right, between two different taxa that we see alive today. All right, so what's the, what's the problem here for, for Ken Ham and Young Earth Creationist? Don't they have the same issues that they are seem to be trying to beat over the head of evolutionary biologists? Because I'm asking the question, where's the missing links? Right? Between a African wild dog, there are there are fossils of African wild dogs that are a couple hundred thousand years old. Um, and but they look similar enough to an African wild dog, they're they, we would still call them an African wild dog. And then there are other fossils, but they look like other, they're clearly other species. And how do I know whether another species that has become an African wild dog and therefore is a transition, all right? It, it is along the lineage, right? along the historical path leading to African wild dogs, or it's a, just a separate species, right? Where are the members of the, of the populations that existed that were dividing into two different groups that would then become the different species? We don't have those. I would, I would even say that Ken Ham doesn't have an oral or, or a written record of the origins of domesticated dogs. There are some fossils of things that are thought to be domesticated dogs that are thousands, years, thousands of years old. Where's the transition fossil between a, what is clearly a wolf and not quite a domesticated dog? Because the first domesticated dog fossil is recognized as a domesticated dog and then there are wolves i don't know of any like strictly in between halfway like we don't call this domesticated dog and this but this clearly isn't a wolf i don't know of any such fossils in other words they're missing but clearly they must be unless cam ham and other creationists are going to are, are truly what they envision is that you have a wolf and then they have some offspring, and most of them are clearly wolves. We'd identify them as wolves by some set of characteristics. But one of the offspring is completely domesticated dog. In other words, they just, there's no transition. They're just uh, immediately formed. Does anyone have any historical records of any of these particular species alive today suddenly giving birth to a completely different species that, that everyone agrees is, is very different and there's no transition? And does he have any record of the original two canines becoming all these different things? And can he see that all being played out? No, there's thousands and thousands of missing or potential missing links that he has to infer. And how does he infer it? He assumes that they're all related. Ken Ham and other creationists assume that all these different canines are related by common ancestry. Now, they have a criteria for that. They say, well, there are some of them, some, not all, but some of them are capable of, of hybridizing with one another. And to them, that's evidence that they may share a common ancestor because they have some genetic compatibility. But they don't have proof that they actually have common ancestry. And for many of them, they don't. <laughs> They're unable to reproduce with one another. And so Ken Ham is inferring Right? He's using the present. He's using similarities between organisms. He's 
looking at their genetic similarities and morphological similarities and creating nested hierarchies to show how these things could have been related and how they could have gone from two dogs to four, I'm sorry, original two canines, and then have a litter of canines and have a population. Eventually that population becomes uh, differentiated and then some of those individuals become differentiated and then within those groups, you know, you, you, you just keep branching and bifurcating off, creating this large nested hierarchy. All of that, we have no eyewitness record of. All of that is inference. But he feels free to say that evolutionary biologists are just making stuff up. Oh, look, it's just they don't see anything there. So what do they call that? They call that a missing link. He doesn't see any of the, uh, of the transitions here either. So he calls those. Uh, he doesn't call that because he, he doesn't bring out this. <laughs> I'm bringing it out for you. He would have to call those all missing links that he has faith exist right that he believes exist based on his evolutionary paradigm right of common ancestry among all the carnivores so okay let let's let's i mean just just one little thing i looked up one paper um and i just want to show you a couple things from it so from the um journal paleontology from 2011 and dennis garards uh garads and uh, he's talking about just about Northwestern African fossil canids. So I looked at a bunch of papers on fossil canids in different parts of the world. There are some 75 other species of canids that are considered to be extinct, right? You only have 35 living ones today. There's lots of extinct ones. And some of those potentially could be intermediate fossils along the chain of history from an ancient uh, canine an ancestral canine and today's canines but it's very difficult to prove you know, what those exact chains are since there are missing links all along the way right for both evolutionary biologists and evolutionary creationists um so for example here is a fossil canine and typically fossil canines aren't known for all the, the entire uh anatomy right this is just all they have is a cranium and you know they have the mandible and they've got some uh, individual uh, molars but this is enough that in this particular paper they're calling it a genus and a species and you see the thing where it says uh, spnov that means sp uh, uh, species nova and that's new species so they're identifying and naming a new species in this particular uh, paper and they're basing it on the cranial features right there's all kinds of measurements of the crania and the teeth and the tooth features. And they're saying like this is uh, out of the statistical range of any known canine. All right. Uh, and different enough that it, we're going to place it in a different genus. So there's like canis, which is wolves and coyotes. Um, but then when you get outside of that, African wild dogs are lycaon or something like that. Uh, a different genus. I, I, you know, indicating that they have enough differences that we place them in their own different subgroups within the larger family uh so what about you know so and this paper is littered with uh, figures like this so what you have here is you just have the um a graph showing you the relationship between the lm1 which is uh one of the molars uh and and p4 which is another um oh boy i can't remember what uh, tooth that is all right, but it's comparing two teeth and it's comparing the length of those two teeth and for a whole bunch of different species and a bunch of individual samples from those species so they have multiple samples of these individual species and so within one species there's some range right of diverse diverse range just like you and i would have slightly different lengths and sizes of some of our teeth but there would be some range for human beings that's different than other species uh, and so what they're doing is they're showing a bunch of different species of canids. And you can see that if you have a small M1, uh, or rather short M1, you also probably have a short P4, right? It scales together to kind of make sense because if, you're, if your jaw gets larger, right, and some of your teeth get larger, probably all of your teeth are getting larger and longer and more deep set in, in your jaw. Uh, and you see differences between an African wild dog, which uh, needs to be able to grind away on, on bones and really, really have uh, very, very solid teeth uh, versus some other carnivores which eat softer foods, right? And then you got your domesticated dogs, which uh, kind of uh, the way we've treated them, they've 
change their teeth somewhat too. But anyway, you see that there's this, this range of characteristics, but it kind of falls along this slope, indicating that you know smaller jawed uh, species versus larger jawed species, you have this scaling effect uh, of that size. Now, you could also look at this as, here's a bunch of different species, and this is what you would expect through history, is if you had a, a small canid, and it were to, over time, through natural selection, become larger and larger and larger, what you'd see is you'd see the tooth size would actually increase or the tooth lengths would increase um, just like you see across many different species in a comparison so historically you might also see this if you had a progression of a whole bunch of different fossils uh, over time and you knew they were in a historical lineage which is kind of hard to know like these are all ancestors not separate species on separate branches um, but potentially you would get a gradual transition right from from a from smaller teeth or shorter teeth uh, to longer rooted teeth uh, over time in different jaw sizes, and so what you're kind of what you're kind of seeing here is what you you might expect in terms of this gradual process of changing from one species to another. But it's not abrupt. It's not like I had a small tooth and then instantly all of a sudden I got really long long teeth, right? There's a whole bunch of different genetic changes that have to occur, and that's not going to occur in a single generation. It's going to occur in many generations. Um, and so if dogs have been around for hundreds of thousands, millions of years, and that's going to be tens of millions of generations, we're not going to have every fossil, you know, for, for tens of millions of generations. We'll be lucky if we have five fossils from five generations out of 10 million generations. In which case, what do you expect to see? I don't expect to see the gradual transition. I expect to see, boom, I expect to see something different here. And then half a million years later, I'll see something that's quite different out of the range. And so I'm going to name each one of those potentially different species because they're going to have such big differences, even though they're actually just a continuous line of one species. Uh, let me, uh, oh, I know, one other thing before I get there. Got a couple other figures to, to show that. Um, all right, at the end of this particular paper, they've got this figure here, and they're showing vulpes, uh, which is uh, foxes, so a couple different foxes. Actually, vulpes, vulpes is your red fox. And as they're pointing out, there is a, the, the dark line here represents, we have fossils stretching from a million years ago, dated a million years, all the way to present. That doesn't mean like there's one every single year, right? It just means that we found ones that are a million years old, maybe one that's 250,000 years old, one that's 50,000. In other words, they, they, they spread that range. And so we'd say like, we have a fossil range that's consistent across that time. Then there's other things that have uh, this dotted line. That means they only have like one fossil. Um, and uh, actually that one's not a very good example. There's others that have uh, maybe a single fossil somewhere and we don't really know where it went extinct and we don't know where the first you know first occurrence is because actually we rarely know the first occurrence of a particular species because it's not labeled like hey i'm the first one that's exactly like this you know if you don't if you keep looking you'll never find another one well, how do you know <laughs> yeah it's it's missing until it's found um, but what i want to show you here is all right, so there's, so there's a bunch of different species, and we have fossils from various different ages, and they have different names because they're clearly distinguishable based on their morphology from each other. And then we draw these lines, and we say, like, it's likely based on the similarities of these, geno uh, of these morphologies, just like a coyote, and a, uh, sorry, a coyote and a wolf have very similar genomes to each other. And they also have similar morphologies, and they have similar behaviors, and there's a bunch of things that are similar. And all of those combined we infer means that if you went back in time, you'd find a common ancestor, a population that was neither of those that eventually gave rise to the distinguishable characters we call different species today. So in this case, what they're doing is they're, they're saying these are the possible connections uh, between these going back to four to four to eight million years ago in terms of where these, these common ancestors are between some of these groups, all right? There's lots and lots of missing pieces to that puzzle. The molecular biology makes it kind of easy to draw those connections because we can infer how the, the genes have changed and eventually gave rise to their common ancestral sequence. Nonetheless, we don't have those sequences, right? But here's the thing, Ken Ham doesn't have those either, right? Ken Ham doesn't have the intermediate fossils, right? 
he has a picture uh, in the Ark Encounter which shows some different carnivore or canines, and he shows connections between those canines going back to a common ancestor. Because he believes they do have a common ancestor. And he believes they're similar enough genetically and morphologically that they are related to one another. And then we might be able to figure out those relationships by looking at different characteristics and making reasonable inferences about them. I, he's doing nothing any different than any evolutionary biologist is doing because this is evolutionary biology and evolutionary inference of about the particular pieces of data we have. Um, all right, so I, I just going to the missing links thing. I want to tell you some reasons why there truly are missing links and sometimes why we'll never find those missing links. And so it's not shocking that there are missing links or lack of intermediate fossils for some uh, between for connections between some species and some groups. So one way of thinking about the change from one species to another over time is a is a gradualistic process. Sometimes you know, like, this is gradualism. Uh, so you consider all right, you have time. So you, if you go back to some time in the past, there was a particular species. All right. And that species, maybe for Ken Ham, this is the two carnivores that walked off the ark, uh, canines that walked off the ark. And those two canines give rise to, you know, other individuals that are very similar. And they give rise to individuals that are fairly similar, but a little bit different. And over time, they're living in different environments. They, they are, you know, they're creating more of their own kind by copying more of themselves but they also can't help but change when they're living in different environments and have genetic variation, especially if they have mutations, which are creating new variants. And over time, they become somewhat different. But from this point to this point, you might look at a fossil here and you might have a fossil here. Maybe you have one fossil in between. We look at the three and you're like, yes, they're different, right? For let's say for let's just talk in Ken Ham's language here. 4,000 years ago, 4,500 years ago, here's a fossil. I happen to have a fossil from right after the flood. And then I have a fossil from right at the time of the global, the biblical ice age, so 500 years later. And then I clearly have a fossil from a little while after that. And they're all different from one another, but they're similar enough that I'm going to say they represent the diversity of a single species. And so I'll call that species A. But, you know, if I go another 250 years up, I, I no longer see that species anymore. And that species doesn't exist today, right? It's extinct. But it's not actually extinct because what happened was at some point there was more changes. And eventually I have another fossil here. Now, this fossil is different enough from the grouping of these three fossils that it kind of falls out of the range. And so therefore, I'm mean, like, eh, it's more different, especially if I have another fossil here. And these two fossils collectively, I see like the mandible size and the cranial width and the, the different molars and the, the little pokey things on the molars. You know, I don't know my anatomy of molars. Um, and I add it all up, I do some statistical analysis, and these two seem to be similar enough that I'm, I'm going to call this, this is a different species. And so now you had this species based on three fossils, you have this species based on two fossils, and then, well, what do you know? I go up a little higher in the fossil record and I have one, two, you know, if I'm lucky, three other samples. Uh, uh, from things that are look similar to each other, that's species C, and then eventually I've got, oh, I've got another species up here, species D. All right, and that's the one that's actually alive today. It could very well be that the four different species uh, actually represent a historical lineage. Right? They represent a continuous population that has been changing, but I'm only seeing little snapshots. And because I only see little snapshots, I, I place them into groups that then look distinguishable from one another, and I call those different species doesn't mean they weren't different species. In fact, species B might, might, not, might not be able to reproduce with the ancestor of species A. But clearly, this original species B could reproduce with the descendant of species A. Right? That's the tricky thing. It's so gradual that uh, it, you know, the, the species gradually changes and every single intermediate step is compatible with each other. But if you were to take your descendant and Go back in the past and try to reproduce with your your I'm sorry your ancestor 
take your descendant and reproduce them with your ancestor, they were like, ah, we're too different. We don't know each other. We're, we're incompatible with one another. So this is one possibility. And so this is one thing that's happening in the fossil record. And so you have different things. Now, Ken Ham would say, oh, you got two species. Well, where's the, where's the transition fossil, right? Where's the missing? There's a bunch of missing links here. Now, he wouldn't think that this is a missing link because if he thought that these were similar to each other and recognized them as the same species, he wouldn't think that, oh, there's actually some missing links between this population and 500 years later, and there's actually a difference between these. Like, these are statistically different in a bunch of different genetic parameters and morphological features, yeah, anatomical features. So, in fact, there's actually hundreds of missing links between those two. It's just that the two ends are similar enough that we call them the same species. And so, fine, they're the same species. I don't really, I'm not really looking for missing parts within the same species. But he's definitely going to come in here and call these missing links. He's like, you don't have a, you don't have a link between those two species, right? How do you know those that one species became that other species? How do you know they weren't separately created? You don't know whether they could reproduce with each other. If they could, maybe they're different kinds, in which case they don't have any connection to one another. Would it be wrong to infer the sequence? Now, of course, one of these species might split off and uh, you have another species and you have two different species. And then that thing could change into a species and that could change into another species. And today we might have two different species, and but they actually share a history, right? This one shares a history with A and this one also shares a history with A. Right? And there's going to be missing links along the way, just like you did in the other one. Yeah, my drawing is terrible. Okay, here's another problem. Here's another thing that can happen. All right, this is actually what I think Ken Ham and Young Earth Creationists should try to argue for their own case, for why they have missing links. Um, but they're not going to talk about how they have missing links because that doesn't make sense because they criticize evolutionary biology for having missing links. Um, Okay, so orient yourself on this figure. We've got uh, time. So we have uh, an original species, a population. All right, so here's a population. It could be 100,000 individuals of, of something, but they're all similar enough. They're able to interbreed. We call that a species. And they have some range of morphology, right? The blue line actually represents the range, but you know, we'll make it wider. We'll say, uh, yeah, all right? So over time, they may waver waver because the environment's changing so they're slightly changing their genetics and their morphology right their appearance slightly changes and it kind of changes and it changes and it's kind of meandering through time but they, they remain very similar to one another so they kind of look like they're in stasis if you had a fossil from here and a fossil from here and a fossil from this time and a fossil from this time they wouldn't look that different would they and you wouldn't really suspect that you had lots and lots of missing links thick to connect these because you would think I have the same species species here and a species at the end and they look kind of similar they may in fact not actually be uh, compatible with each other but for now let's just say they are compatible with each other. it's the same species through time great here's what can happen and here's what surely does happen in many groups and this is a pattern seen in the paleontological record uh, that Stephen Jewell Gould recognized and is part of the, the idea of punctuated equilibrium. Um, now, what happens if there is a particular period in time in which there is, maybe there is a, a lot of uh, upheaval in the climate, uh, in the environment? Um, now, maybe the, the, the same environment continues to exist, but it's much reduced, and many individuals end up in a new environment, forced into a new environment. Right. As they as they as they as some individuals from this population come into a new environment, or experience a new environment. So you had a species that covered the entire uh, North America. All right. Uh, and all of a sudden, something is very different about the East Coast versus the West Coast. Now, the West Coast is the same as it was before that the individuals there will just continue to sort of be adapted to that environment. And so they won't change very much. But the ones on the East Coast are experiencing some real dramatic changes, like their food supply is different and the, and the climate's different and, you know, all this stuff is different, right? They have different uh, competition. So they are going to start adapting to that. 
and they may have to adapt very quickly if the environment changes very, very rapidly. And they may experience a lot of morphological change. They might have some very dramatic mutations that change their morphology quite a bit. And so this change occurs over a relatively short period of time, and then they've adapted to that new environment, and that environment stays relatively constant. What happens is they will just then stay fairly similar over time. Now, what we see today is, in our time slice, is we see two different species. And if we look at fossils, we have a fossil here, and let's say we have a fossil right here on the east coast and the west coast, and we're like, hey, we've got two different species. What if you have a fossil here and you have a fossil here? Hey, we got two different species. What if you don't have any fossils from this period of time and you have a fossil right here? Then you got one species and you don't see any of the other species. And for this particular species, you have a fossil record that consists of, I, I see these things living today and I've got like three fossils. And then everything below that, I don't see it. I've, I've never seen it before. Where did it come from? <laughs> right? Genetics might tell you that it's related to this, but the fossil record looks like there's no connection, right? Absolutely looks like there's no connection because you are missing this period in time. We are definitely missing whole chunks of time because there are times in which they, when the environment's changing, sometimes the conditions for fossilization may be very poor. And again, over how many fossils do we have realistically? You know, how many fossils do we have of coyotes? All right, from half a million years ago or more. Maybe one or two out of how many that may have existed? Billions, right? You gotta get lucky to get fossils. And so any times in which you have rapid change, rapid sudden change that represents only thousands of years, right? Then in those thousands of years, you could have rapid change of one species to another or the morphology might've changed quite a bit. Um, you might have individuals that uh, got transported to an island and then on that particular island they changed a lot because the island conditions were very different and then uh, maybe a thousand years later some of those individuals come back to the mainland you would also get the same pattern you'd have one species the another species evolved somewhere else and then they came back to the same location and now you have two species in that location where you only had one before and you don't ever see the island because maybe the island uh, eroded, right? And we never will have a fossil record ever from that particular island. So we lose all the history of all the things that evolved there. Right? It, what is it going to look like? It's going to appear like that species just appeared out of nowhere. Right? It wasn't there in the fossil record. And then boom, there it was. This is the pattern of the fossil record. And it is the expected pattern of the fossil record. Anyway, it does the statistics and the, and the probabilities of finding fossils and how many links we actually have is not surprised at all, you know, that, that we're missing a lot of these connections. All right, so let's, we gotta wrap this up. Ken Ham has a tremendous amount of faith in his form of evolution, right? He has a tremendous amount of faith that there are connections between these species and that he can actually, or his scientists, can figure those connections out. Without any actual direct observation, without any biblical record telling him the truth, right? He believes in historical science. He's placing his faith in historical studies, historical inferences, using things that we look at today, like DNA sequences of modern species, and inferring back as to how this hierarchical relationship uh, came about. He doesn't have any transition fossils. He's got thousands of missing links between things that he says evolve from one another. Now, it's not that different when you start thinking about, uh, when I know what he'd probably say, he's gonna say, well, like, yeah, but you don't have a transition between a cat and a dog, right? Dogs are all really similar. It's easier to imagine that they have a common ancestor. But what about a common ancestor between a cat and dog? Does, does Ken Ham know about the uh, history, the, the fossil record of canines? Because there is something called the bear dog. There is uh, several other genera that are extinct that are older. So as you go back farther in the fossil record, uh, you start to lose out the canids, the, the canis line disappears.
then you have the Volpe's line, and eventually you have this gray fox. Actually, I don't know how many fossils we have of gray fox, so we might not have the fossil record of that. But anyway, if you go back four million years, there aren't very many things that look like this group right here, right? The things that uh, we have alive today. They don't look like that, but what, what are there? There's a whole bunch of other things. There are like some really big canines um, and some canines that were like the, 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 well, like I said, the bear dogs, which are really, really big canines. Um, and we have other things, and guess what? They look a whole lot more similar to something like bears. And there's actually a, a fossil record of bears, and those bears have other relatives that we infer that were somewhat different than the bears today, that don't have the same exact morphologies of today, and they actually look more canine or general carnivore-like, like a smaller, skinnier, thinner version of a bear. Well, now you're looking at a fossil time in which you have dogs and bears, things that you think look sort of a little bit more like dogs, and some things that look have some specialized characteristics that are a little bit more like bears that you think might be related to bears, but now these two things actually are fairly similar to one another. <laughs> so if Ken Ham were to go back in time, <laughs> right? what if we went back and he went back to the Ark, right? or just before the Ark, and he saw that there was you know, none of these modern bears and none of these modern dogs, and he looked at the ancestors of them. He actually has some of the ancestors on the Ark. And it's funny because you look at the ancestral drawings or the ancestral uh, caricatures of what the ancestral cat and the ancestral dog and the ancestral bear look like. They all look pretty much like each other. It's like you look at them, you go like, well, if I did an analysis on those, they'd all be the same kind. They haven't become different enough looking to think that they're in different kinds. And so his form of these are obviously all the same kind, and therefore it's okay to think that they have a common ancestor. And I can infer all these ancestral relationships, even though I don't have any of those missing links and, and, and so forth. All right? If he just looks at the ancestors of these groups and the missing extinct groups that come in, that, that, that bridge the gap between the morphology of these groups, like bears and seals and dogs, he would discover that his own logic would lead him to believe that all of those are the same kind. Right? There's nothing that would stop him from believing that, given what he's already placed his faith in now. So Kenny Ham is really he thinks this missing links thing is such a like a like a gotcha thing. Um, but it isn't at all. Right? It's a problem for him. But it's not a problem for him if he finds the resolution for it. Unfortunately, if he finds the resolution for why he doesn't have missing links, but it's okay for him to have common ancestry, he's going to then find himself in a situation where his missing links argument won't work all right, for criticizing other forms of evolutionary biology. Okay, that's it. All right, so we got to, you know. Um, Ken, that's a little episode of Ham Bites, Missing Links. Thanks for hanging out. We'll talk to you later. Bye-bye.